It's September 1991, and Linus Torvalds, a computer science student at the University of Helsinki in Finland, has just made a huge breakthrough. He's released the earliest version of the Linux kernel, a free open source operating system that would revolutionize computing. Remember, this was a time when two operating systems dominated the market. Microsoft Disk Operating System, which was the dominant operating system for personal computers, and Unix, which was predominant in academic and research settings. Unfortunately, both were commercial and cost upwards of thousands of dollars. Fast forward to 2025, and Linux, which accounts for a tiny fraction of the desktop market, around 4.45%, is proving to be more useful than ever in a fast-growing space, robotics. This is the story of how Linux began and why it actually matters for robotics. Like the video, subscribe if you haven't already, and let's jump right in. It is 1991, and Linus Torvalds, a computer science student, is increasingly getting frustrated. His frustrations, however, have nothing to do with personal life, but Minix, a Unix-like operating system used for teaching operating system concepts. Developed by Andrew Tannenbaum in 1987, Minix has significant limitations that Torvalds just can't take anymore. 1. Minix's license prohibits commercial use and requires users to buy it from Prentice Hall, limiting accessibility. 2. Minix doesn't allow unrestricted modification and redistribution of its source code. And 3. Minix requires users to pay making it unaffordable for students like Torvalds and other developers. Catalyzed by these restrictions, Torvalds set out to develop his own kernel. He wants a system that is free to use, modify, and share without licensing constraints, unlike Minix. Finally, on September 17, 1991, he actualizes his dream, releasing Linux to the world. Linux's journey began with version 0.01 in September 1991. Announced by Torvalds in a Usenet post on August 25, 1991, where he invited others to contribute, this release was pretty basic. Just a month later, in October 1991, version 0.02 arrived. This version is small, containing just over 10,000 lines of code, but it is the first usable Linux release. Developers start taking notice. By 1992, Linux had taken a major leap forward. Version 0.12 was relicensed under the GNU General Public License, making Linux fully open source and allowing developers worldwide to modify and distribute it freely. Around the same time, Linux began integrating with GNU tools, transforming it into a complete operating system, GNU slash Linux. As Linux grew, distributions emerged to make it easier to use. Soft Landing Linux System, SLS, appeared in 1992, laying the foundation for future distributions. In 1993, two key distributions were born. Slackware, which evolved from SLS and remains active today, and Debian, founded by Ian Murdoch and known for its stability and community-driven development. By 1994, Linux had reached a major milestone. Version 1.0 was released, and for the first time, the Linux kernel was considered mature. Just two years later, in 1996, version 2.0 introduced symmetric multiprocessing SMP support, making Linux a powerful option for enterprise environments. However, something becomes clearer than ever. Linux is only gaining attention among tech enthusiasts. For the average computer user, it's a daunting system to navigate. Unlike Windows or Mac OS, Linux offers no graphical interface, no plug-and-play software, and little in the way of beginner-friendly guidance. One of the biggest challenges is the command line interface. Everything, installation, configuration, and daily tasks, must be done through text commands, which is overwhelming for users accustomed to clicking icons. Then there's hardware support, or the lack of it. Early Linux versions don't automatically recognize devices like sound cards or printers. Users often have to manually compile drivers or tweak system files, a task that requires deep technical knowledge. 
even if someone manages to install Linux, they'll face another roadblock, software availability. Many popular applications don't run on Linux, limiting its appeal. Finding alternatives often means compiling programs from source code, a process far removed from the simple installations of Windows. Speaking of installation, setting up Linux itself is an intimidating experience. Partitioning hard drives, configuring bootloaders, and resolving kernel errors can easily go wrong, forcing users to start over. Finally, there's the steep learning curve. Linux, being Unix-like, introduces concepts such as file permissions, shell scripting, and process management. While these are second nature to developers, they are completely foreign to everyday users. Because of Linux's flexibility and open source nature, several distributions emerged throughout the 1990s to address various issues. Let's first talk about the most important one. Launched in 1993, Debian quickly gained a reputation for stability, flexibility, and strict adherence to open source principles. However, for beginners at the time, Debian was anything but easy. One of the biggest hurdles was installation complexity. Early versions of Debian lack a graphical installer, forcing users to navigate a text-based setup. Tasks like partitioning hard drives and configuring hardware manually make the process intimidating. Even after installation, hardware support poses another challenge. Debian's strict open source policy means that proprietary drivers are not included by default. Users with certain Wi-Fi cards or graphics chips often find themselves without internet access unless they manually install the missing drivers. A task that's not straightforward for newcomers. Then, there's Debian's approach to software updates. Prioritizing stability, Debian often ships older versions of applications in its official repositories. While this ensures reliability, it means users who want the latest features might have to backport or compile software from the source, a time-consuming process. Now, let's talk about the revolutionary Ubuntu distribution, created by Canonical Lint -E. In 2004, Ubuntu embraced the philosophy of humanity to others, focusing on ease of use and accessibility. For the first time, installing Linux is simple for users. Ubuntu introduces a graphical installer that guides users through the process with minimal effort. Features like live CDs allow users to test the system before committing to an installation. Hardware support is another game changer. Unlike Debian, Ubuntu includes proprietary drivers out of the box, ensuring that Wi-Fi, graphics, and other hardware work immediately. No more struggling with manual driver installation. The user interface also makes Linux more approachable. With GNOME, Ubuntu delivers an intuitive and visually appealing desktop that feels familiar to those coming from Windows or macOS. Essential tools are easy to find, reducing the learning curve. Most importantly, Ubuntu fosters a huge community. Online forums, detailed documentation, and widespread support mean that help is always available. Then, sometime before 2007, two PhD students of the Robotics Laboratory at Stanford University noticed that a lot of their colleagues in the personal robotics program were finding it hard to keep up with the diverse nature of robotics development, which included both hardware and software knowledge. And so, to make it easier for not just their colleagues but others in the field too, the two students start developing a set of open source frameworks for robot software development which would later be collectively known as ROS, the Robot Operating System. ROS's first release, dubbed TurtleBox, was primarily built on Linux Ubuntu Hardy. The developers of ROS decided to base the robotics framework into the easiest and most popular Linux distribution. Now, there were a few major reasons ROS developers preferred Ubuntu Linux as the primary foundation for the framework's development over other systems. Linux is, of course, open source, which means that developers can modify the code to suit specific needs. In fact, 
robotics developers can optimize Linux for real-time applications, such as sensor data processing, which is critical in robotics. Also, since Linux is an open-source OS that has been in the industry for decades, an extensive community has grown around it. This means there is so much knowledge, resources and support for developers. This community has been quite beneficial for the growing robotics sector, where complex problems often require a collective approach. Additionally, Linux is pretty lightweight, a feature that allows ROS to run efficiently on resource-constrained hardware environments, which is actually quite common in the field of robotics. Linux is also known for its stability and reliability, both of which are crucial components for robotics applications. The system rarely crashes and is generally easier to update without requiring system resets. This ensures continuous operation, which is actually great for robotics because downtime can be quite costly. Lastly, Ubuntu Linux's native package managers, more specifically Advanced Package Tool, or APT for short, make ROS installation, updating and management really simple and efficient, a system that Windows doesn't have. ROS 2 would eventually support other popular operating systems like Windows and Mac OS. However, this is more or less considered experimental, and Linux, well, it remains the dominant and most stable platform for ROS development. In fact, the majority of ROS packages are either developed or tested on Linux first. And even key ROS tools like RViz and Gazebo Simulator are optimized for Linux. This means that if you want to get serious into robotics, you need to learn Linux. And there is no better place to start that with the free course of the construct Linux for Robotics. On that course, you will learn the Linux system, but fully orientated to robotics. You will be practicing with simulated robots and remote real robots while learning Linux. You can get a certificate if you present the Linux project. Check it out on the link below or on this QR code. Today, robotics is a super fast growing market with a projected revenue of $40.8 billion in 2025. Service Robotics dominates the market with a projected revenue volume of $40.58 billion. In fact, Service robots, which basically assist human employees with daily monotonous, time-consuming, repetitive, or even potentially dangerous, can be found in almost all industries, including manufacturing, healthcare, hospitality, transportation and logistics, construction, agriculture, and customer service, to name a few. The most interesting bit, though, is that these robots are built with ROS. That's right. ROS is quickly becoming the de facto standard for robotic software, with a community of millions of developers. In fact, most robotic startups are building their robots using ROS frameworks. Its multi-domain and multi-platform approach means that it can be used to develop robots, no matter where they will be deployed, making it a key asset in robotics. One thing is for sure, ROS, and by extension, Linux is here to stay in robotics. So, if you aspire to become a robotics developer, then you definitely should learn Linux. Now, if you want to learn more about Linux and ROS to become a skilled robotics programmer, subscribe to our channel. Also, visit The Construct to find a wide variety of online courses today.